Well, it's a real pleasure to present the final report of the outcome study. This has been a labor of love for the ASAP, really, for many years. Uh, it all started with uh, Marcy Spear, for uh, those of you who know her, um, who was really the heart of this organization and driving force, and she decided that we have to do an outcome study. Um, and so uh, after Marcy died, uh, there was a bit of a hiccup in all the arrangements, uh, and it delayed the start of the study. Uh, finally, we got it through. The, uh, the paper uh, was just uh, revised. Uh, hopefully, it will be accepted soon. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit of the history behind this outcome study and what we found and what the next steps should be. Um, we started with an ASAP member survey. And the main question was, what do you think should be studied? And these are examples of uh, what people said. And by far and away, the number one question that people had was, what is the difference between the Chiari surgery techniques? Which one is better? So uh, we took that at heart and went to the ASPN, which is the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgeons, our senior society, uh, and did a survey that we ended up publishing that uh, looked at what people did. Um, and because before you can study what the differences uh, are in outcomes, you want to know what people do around the country. And what we found that at the time, uh, there were less than half of people uh, opened the dura and shrunk the tonsils. Less than half opened the dura without reducing the tonsils. And about 5% did the bone-only decompression. Uh, I believe the ratio is different now. There are more people that, that I know who are doing bone-only decompressions. And, and now the Park Reeves Foundation is, uh, with Dave Limbrick is doing a study just on bone-only versus duraplasty. So uh, what's a pilot trial, which is what this is? Uh, pilot, by definition, is something exploratory. It's a feasibility study intended to guide in planning a large-scale investigation. So this is not intended to give an answer, an absolute answer. That would require over a million dollars. It, but it sets the stage for that study to be done. Pilot studies comprise a risk mitigation strategy to reduce the chance of failure of a larger project. You don't want to be putting $2 million into a project, then you realize that one of your initial concepts was wrong, and the whole study uh, uh, you know, dies. Uh, this is a, a commonly done um, uh, thing in uh, cancer research uh, with chemotherapy and radiation. They start with a small pilot study, then they move on to the larger trial. It's much less done in, in neurosurgery for other than cancer. So the goals of a pilot study or a pilot project are uh, divided into several categories. You have to figure out how much recruitment you need. How many patients do you need to really answer a question? So a pilot study can help you cal calculate sample size for the larger study. Um, what is the retention rate? What is the refusal rate, the real reliability? If you, if you accrue 100 patients, are 20% of them going to drop out, or 30%, or 5%? It's important to know all these numbers before you set out to do a big trial. The resources, how much time and budget it would take. Uh, the management, what, it what, what would it take in, uh, for the participating centers to be, con uh, to be compliant and to, and to do things the way we, uh, it needs to be done? Uh, and then, of course, the scientific. Uh, what is it going to take to answer that question? How many patients? How many MRIs? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, structure? So the goals of our uh, uh, particular uh, group was to design a very objective, prospective trial that's backed up by the academic neurosurgical community and that has unbiased 
uh, uh, physicians who, who run the study, who analyze the results, and has a very crisp endpoint. And by this, I mean, if you, for example, run a Chiari decompression trial for headache, and you, you just finished hearing how many different types of headaches there are, how some are related to migraine other than to Chiari, other than to cluster headaches, et cetera, how the subjectivity of the day-to-day -day headache is very difficult to assess. That study is doomed to fail. However, if you can see a syrinx on MRI and the syrinx goes away after surgery, nobody argues with this. So that's why the primary endpoint that we chose was syringomyelia, even though the secondary endpoint of clinical improvement is really what we're all looking for. We wanted it to be as unbiased as possible. So the initial plan, which we were able to stick to in, in large part, was to have the study participants be non-ASAP medical advisory board members. We felt that maybe being an advisory board member would give us a little bit of bias in recruitment. Uh, and even the managing centers, meaning our center in Madison and Tim George's in Austin, as well as the statistician, John Kessel, in Utah, uh, none of these centers accrue patients. We were completely out of the equation so that we'd be as unbiased as possible. We also wanted geographic diversity, surgeon diversity, institutional diversity. And we've tried, we did the best that we could to achieve this, and, and I'll show you the data. The study is all pediatric because when you add an adult component, it adds a whole set of complications. Um, as I said, Chiari 1 with syringomyelia, there's no surgical randomization because it's really not feasible. Uh, if you have a Chiari malformation and syringomyelia that's symptomatic, you go to the neurosurgeon and he says, oh, by the way, we're randomizing you to the non-surgical group, you're going to have a problem with that. Uh, or if you even... Uh, Anyway, randomization in surgery is, is very difficult. So we decided instead to do a prospective cohort trial that uses the surgeon's own routine practice. We don't make the surgeon, we didn't make the surgeons change their practice to get the data that we need. But for this, we need to guarantee at least some homogeneity in how the surgeons manage these patients. Uh, we want the surgeons, for example, to be able to, uh, the surgeons who would get an MRI at three to six months after surgery. We don't want to have a surgeon who gets it at three months and the other one that gets it at two years. We want to make sure that those surgeons routinely see their patients at three months and one year. And so we, we tried to look uh, at that survey that I talked to you about earlier uh, in a way to help us pick the centers that, that we've uh, recruited. So these are the final eight centers that we've uh, recruited and that uh, stayed with the study. We started out with 12, and we weeded out four uh, uh, down to eight. Uh, these are the number of patients that we've accrued in each center and the number of surgeons. Uh, the surgeons in general did the same surgery. Uh, so some surgeons would do duraplasty with tonsillar reduction, others do duraplasty alone, uh, but the same surgeon usually stuck to the same technique. This is uh, just a, a summary view, a bird's eye view of the patient population. So there were 75 recruited, uh, five uh, did not meet criteria, two withdrew, we end up with 68 patients. These are the ones that, uh, that had full uh, primary endpoint data, so there were 58 patients that had MRI scans, uh, 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 MRI scans that are reliable, and these are the ones that had full clinical data, and there were 55 of those patients. So we ended up with 58 in this group, 55 in that group. There was no difference in demographics uh, between the sites. There was no difference in the uh, number or percent of surgery type between the sites. Uh, and so uh, there was no bias from that standpoint. The clinical presentations are what you would usually expect with uh, Chiari and Syringomyelia. Uh, of interest is that more and more these days we're seeing 
patients with frontal headaches as opposed to occipital headaches. A big percentage uh, had frontal headaches. Uh, so these are the symptoms, these are the physical exam findings. <clears throat> there were three radiology groups that assessed the results of the MRIs separately um, and blindly, meaning that we give them the MRI without a name, without knowing which, uh, which, uh, uh, category, which group they fit in. Uh, and uh, there were three sets of evaluators. Uh, each evaluator group had two or three people in it, either uh, usually a combination of neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists. And what we found is that there was uh, complete agreement between the evaluator groups uh, as to the size of the syrinx and, and the extent of improvement. Uh, and um, in, when we compared the tonsil, uh, tonsil resection group from, uh, compared to the duraplasty group without tonsil reduction, we found that if we were looking for any improvement, there was no difference between the two groups, 88% versus 88%. However, if we're looking at more than 50% improvement at one year, then there's a little bit more uh, improvement in the tonsil uh, reduction group compared to the non-tonsil groups. Uh, that was not statistically significant, so it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's not, uh, uh, the re re we can't say that there's improvement in this group based on these data. Uh, the other thing to note is that this is at one year, and the question is, would you see the same results at two years, or would, then, would you then see equilibration? When it came to the secondary endpoints, there was also uh, no statistically significant difference between the two groups. Uh, there are some symptoms that improve in one group versus the other, and vice versa, uh, but it all um, equilibrated at the end. <clears throat> so, like I told you before, uh, part of the goal of a pilot study is to identify challenges and problems. And so we've spent a good part of our analyses, and in fact, a big part of the paper uh, that we submitted, looking at these challenges. Uh, it's unusual for papers in our literature these days to bring up all the limitations and all the challenges that, that people have faced building a study, but we felt that was essential if we're going to help the next group that's going to do a larger study. So first of all, there was a surgery type problem in that initially the study was supposed to study bone-only decompressions versus uh, bone with dura versus bone with dura with tonsil. We were not able to accrue enough bone-only uh, patients, and, uh, and, the and there were two centers that were primarily bone-only centers that dropped out early in the study. And so what happened is that we then removed the bone-only arm from the study and left it at two arms, duraplasty versus duraplasty with tonsil resection or reduction which cut down the number of patients in the study from uh, you know, 90 to 120 down to 60 to 90. So uh, currently there, were more, there are more bone-only proce procedures being done. Uh, we feel that this can be done uh, or should be studied separately. And in fact, the PECORI uh, study is ongoing that studies bone only versus duroplasty. So that would be complementary to this. The second set of challenges has to do with patient recruitment and data entry. Uh, first, we uh, gave uh, stringent steering criteria. Steering has to be a certain size to be, to be acceptable. So that really lowered the number of patients that we can uh, recruit into the study. But the most important problem that we've identified is that there was poor retention of local coordinators. So when we have a local center, let's say Duke, uh, who uh, is recruiting, for example, 10 patients, uh, and we're having difficulty getting the coordinators to send us the data from those patients, from every clinic visit and, and every MRI, uh, that's because uh, oftentimes coordinators tend to 
not be consistent or leave. And <clears throat> the way that we feel that we've addressed some of these problems is that uh, decreasing the center numbers uh, eliminated part of these problems. We've started monthly communicating, communications with the centers and quarterly newsletter for all the centers. More importantly, what's going to impact the future studies <coughs> is that uh, I think that uh, uh, paying, putting more funding into the local centers would allow the local centers to hire people who are uh, there for a purpose and who will stay there. So, for example, we were paying $500 per patient uh, to the center. Um, the PCORI group now is paying $1,000 per patient. And I think $1,000 in a larger study would allow you to hire a full-time coordinator. Whereas even $1,000 with a small study, you won't be able to keep those types of coordinators. And the third challenge was uh, patient management inconsistencies. So as I told you before, the study design was based on surgeons' own care routine. We didn't make the surgeons change their care in any way. And therefore, there was some inconsistency in the management between the surgeons and some inconsistency with the timing of the postoperative images. Uh, even though we tried very hard to select the centers based on a national survey that specifically asked, when do you get MRIs, how do you, when do you see the patients in clinic, etc. Uh, again, a larger study would be accompanied by more funding, which would allow retention and consistency of local coordinator, which would solve this problem. So, what does it all mean uh, to us? Well. As I stated before, pilot study uh, plays a key role in development and refinement of new interventions, assessments, and other procedures. There are ethical considerations. Uh, there is an obligation to, of the research group uh, to the patient to disclose the feasibility and nature of the pilot study. So all these challenges, I think we have a responsibility to, to tell the patients and tell the readership about them. Uh, and here I can say that we've identified kinks and problems to address uh, as larger studies are planned. The second goal of a pilot study, and the main goal, is to uh, come up with a uh, sample size calculation to determine how big of a study needs to uh, follow after this. So this is a, a bit uh, complicated, so I'm going to try to, uh, to explain it. Uh, if we were to look at any improvement in syringomyelia after surgery, there is equivalence between the two groups. So any study that's going to be better than this will have to have an infinite number of patients. So from that standpoint, a pilot study would be definitive. Uh, we, uh, you can definitively say here that uh, there is equivalence and improvement in syringe myelia after surgery, if you look at any syrinx improvement, which means even if there's 10% decrease in the size of the syrinx. However, if you make the criteria stringent enough that we want to look for at least 50% decrease in the size of the syrinx, then there is a difference between the two groups. So in order to mount a bigger study, th these are the numbers that we would need, patient numbers, to be able to conduct such a study to answer the, answer, uh, to the question definitively. So the question is, if I were to tell the surgeons in the group, let's say a surgeon who only does duraplasties, that a tonsillar reduction will give you a 20% improvement over duraplasty. Is this sufficient for a duraplasty surgeon to change his technique to tonsillar reduction? He'll say tonsillar reduction is accompanied by more complications. Why should I do this for 20%? But if I were to tell the surgeon there's a 50% improvement in the tonsillar group, then that surgeon is going to think about it and say, well, 50%, that's pretty notable. So the numbers that I put in here uh, is ex are exactly based on this concept. So let's say this is a duraplasty improvement rate. And this is tonsillar improvement rate. A 20% improvement. To show a 20% improvement with a larger study, you need 265 patients per group. To show a 30% improvement, you need 146 patients per treatment group. 
And to show a 50% improvement, you only do need 52 patients. So this will help the next research group uh, uh, calculate the size of whatever study they need to do. So uh, surgical trials for Chiari Sergamalia are feasible. Uh, in our case, we worked out some kinks for larger studies. Uh, pilot data so far indicate that tonsillar reduction may not add benefit to duraplasty alone. The question is, with tonsil coagulation, are there long-term negative effects? And that's, of course, the $64,000 question, which hopefully Bob Keating will address. So how can ASAP make a long-term difference? Certainly funding similar clinical studies would be important. Targeting important questions with each one of these studies and supporting the large registries that are ongoing and that can do way more that, than we can do with 100 patients. They can do it with thousands of patients. Most importantly, I think it's important to encourage physicians and scientists to collaborate. It is so evident now in our literature that many of the studies that are published are retrospective or single, single center studies and those don't really advance the field significantly. Studies that advance the field are always collaborative. And, uh, and I think that a, a, a major uh, benefit of having a society like this one is you can bring the physician and researchers and engineers together to collaborate on those studies. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tim George, my co-PI, uh, John Kessel for statistical planning, the participating centers, the two uh, students, uh, residents that, uh, that uh, uh, helped me finalize the study, our data and IRB center, uh, and of course, ASAP for funding. Most importantly though, uh, uh, I would like to thank and dedicate this to Marcy Spear. Thank you very much. <laughs>